All right, Paul, we're starting to actually get some properties of these stars, size, temperature, brightness. How do, what's the classification? How does this all fit together? OK, so we can start actually trying to work out. We now know this is a mass progression. These yep. are massive stars. But how massive? Again, yep. we can use binary stars to work this out. We can also compare to our models. We can take our model for the sun and put, put more mass in and see what, what sort of radius and temperature. And so by combining all this, we can also use astro Yep. We can measure the pulsations of other stars and use that to measure the interior, not in as much detail as the sun. But that all gives us a lot of information. So basically, O stars are more than about 16. This little circle with the dot in is the astrological symbol for the sun. So that means mass of the sun. So, so we're going to be putting everything into scale of mass of the sun minus radius temperature. Radius of the sun, luminosity of the sun. Again, because 10 to the 38 versus 10 to the 40 kilograms doesn't mean anything. Yeah, so we're using the sun as the measure of all things. Yep. And so the O stars, we're talking about, they're more than 16 solar masses. They're more than six times the radius of the sun, hotter than 30,000 degrees, more than 30,000 times the brightness of the sun. That's why, despite, they're incredibly rare. Yes. 0.0003% of stars, roughly, so are we're getting, stars. So for every sun, you're getting, or so for every 10,000 suns almost, you're getting about one O star. Incredibly rare. And they don't last very long. They are so luminous, they're burning through the hydrogen fuel so fast, basically because there's such a huge mass pushing down on the middle, it allows it to get much hotter and burn much faster. So instead of that 9 to 10 billion year main sequence that our sun goes through, these are doing it in 10 million years. Less than. Less than 10 million years. And in fact, you can see some of these really hot stars. Um, the best place is actually the Orion Nebula we talked about in star formation. In the middle of here are the four very hot, newly formed stars, the trapezium, one of which is an O star and the other three of which are B stars. Uh -huh. Now, uh, these are uh, pretty massive, but the most massive we know are actually not in our own galaxy, but in the Magellanic Clouds. This is yep. a 30 Doradus or Tarantula Nebula. And there are some stars in here up to maybe a couple of hundred solar masses. So they can even get bigger than that. They can get much bigger than 16 we solar masses. We actually subdivide the categories. So oh, okay. O star, we can call it an O1, O2, O3, uh, O4. So these would be the lower number O stars are going to be the very hottest, the very much most massive, whereas the O8s and 9s would be like the ones in the uh, Orion Nebula. Okay. Now, there don't seem to be any stars more than a one or 200 solar masses big. Yes, yeah, so is there a limit? There seems to be, and it's probably the really massive stars collapse to form black holes right away, or maybe they're just rare and never form in the first place. So I guess was because, because these stars that are 16 times the mass of our sun are only lasting less than 10 million years, if you get something that's 100 or 1,000, they're going to be around for not even a million years, and that means less than that. Yeah, so... They're very bright, so we can see them at enormous distances. Yep. So we, there are a lot of them out there that we can see, but they're actually vanishingly rare. Yep. As you go down in temperature, the masses drop. So G star obviously is about a solar mass because the sun is a G star. Yep. Um, and then you get to the other extreme. When you get to the M stars, these are what we'd call red dwarf stars. Okay. And they're typically from about one tenth of a solar mass up to about half a solar mass. So a lot smaller. Uh, yeah, but only a factor of two or so as opposed to a factor of ten there. True. They're not that physically small. Yep. Temperature, two to three thousand degrees or something. But the luminosity is less than you know, eight, eight percent of the luminosity of the sun. They put up pathetic amounts of radiation. But I guess this is what is astounding to me, right, is how many of them are out there. Yes, so red dwarfs are it, basically. I mean, they're 76 percent, roughly, of all the stars in our own neighborhood in the so, galaxy. So if we had 100 stars, and we took 100 stars, 76 of them would be these M stars, and another 12 would be these K stars, so, mo so almost 90 of them yeah. would be these really small, cool stars. So if you look at our sun, our sun's often called a yellow dwarf star, the G-type star, but in fact it's in the top 10% you know, of all stars in terms of mass. Most stars are cooler and less massive than the sun. Yep, yeah, but as, as we looked at, you know, the O stars are only around for a fraction of the time. These things can last for way, way, way longer than our sun. Well, basically, none of these, um, none of the K and M stars has ever died. Because uh, our universe is only, what, 14 billion years yeah. old, and the lifespan of these is 70 up to 300 billion years. So we really almost don't see these things ending. They just can keep going for... Every one of these stars that's ever been born is still around. Whereas these O stars, they're gone. I think they're like rock stars. They, they live furiously and they die young. <laughs> um, 
Uh, so we've seen that uh, when we get these very massive stars around, here's an M star. Do you recognize mm -hmm. this one? Yes, I think this is uh, a famous M star. It happens to be our neighbor, Proxima Centauri. Yes, so the very nearest system is a triple system yep. with two G-type stars, Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B, and in a very distant orbit around them, one red dwarf, M dwarf star Proxima Centauri that at the moment happens to be closer than the other ones. So when we look at the Southern Cross, we see those two bright pointers and that bright one's Alpha Centauri. And so that's three stars, two yeah. which are close, but one which is going really far around the other two. And that the star we call Alpha Centauri is actually, if you look through a telescope, two stars close yep. together, but to the human eye, this looks like one. Yep. Um, and then you've got Proxima. And this, despite being the nearest star to us, it's too faint to see with the naked eye. And that's when we were looking at that table just a minute ago. As you said, it's uh, not even 10%. It's a fraction of a percent uh, at some times, the brightness of our own sun. That's right. So this one's about um, nearly 100 times too faint to see with the human eye. So these, these things are very common, hard to see. Um, People will go like the, the, the rats of space, if you like. <laughs> Huge numbers of them swarming around. Uh, but they're almost invisible because they're so pathetic. But can you have stars even smaller than this? Well, from that HR diagram, this is, ends up being the question. We didn't see that many stars cooler than that, but physically, th is there a reason you couldn't? Well, basically, as they get less than about 8% of a solar mass, their mass is so low that they never start nuclear fusion. So really, so what ends up being the limit is less anything other than how much mass is there to create that nuclear fusion, to create that reaction on the inside. Yeah, that blanket of gas on the outside is not heavy enough to, so that the center never gets hot enough to do hydrogen nuclear fusion. It can actually burn deuterium, but deuterium is very rare and that puts up very little power. So what happens if you just have a very small blanket? Well, these are called uh, the, the brown dwarfs. Okay, so uh, I assume they're darker than red, is that They're the name? They're much fainter, and the red stars are pretty faint, and these are much fainter and much cooler still because they've got basically no power source or only a very small power source. So we think they're still technically a star, or no? Nah. Well, it's now starting to become a sort of classification. I mean, if it doesn't have fusion, it's still is it a, a very small star or a very big planet. Yeah, so where does it fit into the scheme? Well, you look at the size of the thing. So okay. now we've got the sun, that would be an M dwarf, a low mass star, and then brown dwarfs and Jupiter. So it really is kind of in the scheme of temperature, size, mass, it's between a M somewhere star. between the M stars and the giant planets. But I think the general consensus is they actually are, they're formed in the same way as yep. stars. Jupiter, you get only an orbit around a star, but yep. brown dwarfs, some of them are in orbit, but most of them are actually floating freely in space. So probably they really are like failed stars, so stars they, that tried to form in the normal way, but they were just so small. They just didn't get that enough blanket to kick on, and then they just kind of petered out. Yeah. And early on, people thought they might be incredibly common. They mm. might, we already know that the, the yes, uh, M right. stars are 76% of everything. Uh, the, brown, but the brown dwarfs turn out to be probably no more common than M stars, or possibly even a bit less common. So they're actually less common than M dwarfs, we think. Yes, there's actually a, like a gap here. Okay. Because you kind of think that as the star gets less massive, they get more and more of them. Yep. So every time you went to a less and less massive star, you got more and more. That's right. But it actually stops when you get to the M. When you go down to the brown dwarfs, the numbers... There's still a lot of them, but they're probably as many as there are, or maybe a few times more, or maybe a few times less. It's very hard to spot them because they're yeah. so faint. Yeah. You have to look in the infrared because they emit almost no visible light. But they're not drastically outnumbering everything else. So there ends up being almost a limit to what you're forming. And then you get planets, and they seem to form differently. So there really does seem to be a difference between the lowest mass stars, the brown dwarfs, and the highest mass.